All right, so you're building out your Proxmox server and, um, you know, you're going to need storage. Of course. And you probably, you've probably heard of ZFS, right? Oh, yeah. ZFS is like the, the big name that gets thrown around. It's like, the, it's like the cool kid on the block when it comes to file systems, right? Yeah, it's got all those cool feeders. Snapshots, compression. It's got self-healing. People yeah. go, you got to use ZFS even if it's a single drive. It's, well, you know, it can do a lot. Yeah, but in this deep dive, we're going to maybe challenge that a little bit. Okay. Especially in the context of Proxmox. We're going to look at why maybe just maybe ext4 uh-huh. the uh you know the other file system that's been around forever yeah the the old standby the old standby mm-hmm. might be a better fit for you for your particular setup it's about choosing the right tool for the job right right exactly and sometimes maybe the maybe the simpler tool yeah. is the better option right and so we're going to go through why that might be yeah so we'll look at some of the reasons why uh like the learning curve yeah. The tuning that might be required, yeah. how much RAM it uses, mm-hmm. what it does with SSDs, and some of those other considerations, like mm-hmm. if you need to recover your data, things like that. Yeah. So let's jump right into it. Yeah. I think a good place to start is the learning curve with ZFS. Okay, yeah. ZFS, it's not just a file system. It's it's kind of like a whole different way of thinking about storage. Yeah, you almost need like a, you know, a dictionary to figure out what they're talking about half the time. Yeah. Pools, VDEVs. Record size, ARC, L2, ARC, you've got... Yeah, there's a lot of terminology. There's a lot of terminology, yeah, and it can get very overwhelming. Especially, yeah, if you're just starting out. If you're just starting out, and I'm thinking, you know, you're setting up your Proxmox server at home. Yeah. Do you really want to spend your whole weekend reading ZFS tuning guides? Probably not. Most people just want to get their server up and running. Right. You just want to, like, get it going. Exactly. And ext 4 is Kind of like that. It's like, you know. Format the drive, you mount it, and off you go. It just works. It just works. Been around forever. It's stable. It's like, yeah, it's like the Toyota Camry of file systems. I like that, yeah. Reliable. You know what you're going to get. But let's say, okay, you, you've decided to go with ZFS. Okay. You've you've climbed that learning curve. You got it set up. But then there's the ongoing tuning. And, and sometimes the quirky things that can happen with ZFS. Yeah, yeah. Like I was reading about these pauses that can happen because of how it does these transaction group rights. Have you run into that? Yeah, yeah. So it's a way of ensuring that the data gets written consistently, but it can cause these these little hiccups in performance. Like a little stutter. Yeah, like a little stutter every now and then, especially if you're doing a lot of writes. Especially if you're doing a lot of yeah. writes. And then there's the, the whole thing with sync writes, like the ones that need to be written to disk right away. Right, yeah. Those can be problematic for ZFS if you don't have a dedicated log device. Uh, S-log, they call it. Yeah, S-log, yeah. It's basically a really fast SSD that you use as a cache for those synchronous writes. Oh, I see. So another thing to manage. Another thing to buy. Exactly. Another point of failure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's something to consider. With the XT4. (laughs) I format it, I'm done. (laughs) No need to worry about my SSD wearing out faster because of how ZFS does those checksums and the copy on write stuff. Yeah, ext4 kind of just lets the SSD do its thing. And speaking of things that ZFS likes to do, have you heard about its um, its love affair with RAM? Oh yeah, ZFS yeah. loves RAM. It's like yeah. it wants to eat all the RAM. ZFS is a RAM hog, that is for sure. It's got this thing, this RRC. It's called the Adaptive Replacement Cache. It just eats RAM like it's going out of style. So the more RAM you have, the more ZFS will use to cache data and make things faster. And, you know, you can limit it, but then that's another setting you got to tune. Yeah. XD4 just kind of sips the RAM. Yeah. It's much more lightweight in terms of memory usage. Lightweight, yeah. And so if you've got an older machine with limited RAM. EXT4 is a good choice. EXT4 starts to look pretty good. Yeah. Now let's talk SSDs for a minute. You know, everyone loves SSDs for the speed. Yeah, they make a big difference. But ZFS can do this weird thing where it can disable the drive-level cache on your SSD. Yeah, so if ZFS is not sure about the data safety of the drive's cache, it might just disable it as a precaution. To protect the data. Exactly. Data integrity is paramount for ZFS. Which is good, right. But then, you know, you've bought this nice SSD with its own caching and power loss protection. Right. And ZFS is like, nope. I don't trust you, turning that off. And that can impact performance? Especially those bursty workloads. Yeah. So ZFS, while trying to be helpful, Uh can actually hinder your performance. Yeah, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. And then you've got the copy on write and all that checksumming that Mm -hmm. ZFS does, right? Yeah. Great for data integrity. Right. But it also increases the amount of writes 
going to the SSD. Which can shorten the lifespan of the SSD potentially, especially with cheaper consumer grade SSDs. So you're trying to protect your data, but you're potentially wearing out your drive faster. It's catch 22. Yeah, something to think about. EXT4 on the other hand, just lets the SSD handle all that stuff internally. Yeah. So you potentially get smoother performance and longer life out of your drive. Potentially. Okay, now everyone talks about snapshots when they talk about ZFS. Yeah, it's one of the big features. Instant snapshots roll back to any point in time. It's amazing. Mm. But with EXT4, do you completely lose that ability? Not necessarily. So in Proxmox, you can use LVM Thin or QCOW2 images, and you can still take snapshots even if you're using EXT4. So I can still have those restore points. Yeah. They may not be as, you know, full-featured as ZFS snapshots. I see. You might not be able to, you know, replicate them across a cluster or something like that. But right. But for basic snapshotting, they're generally good enough. So if I mess something up, I can roll back. Exactly. I don't need ZFS for that. Exactly. Now, what about encryption? Because keeping our data safe is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. ZFS has native encryption, right? Yeah. But I was reading, it can be a little... Uh, it can be a little tricky. Tricky, especially yeah. with Proxmox's high availability setup. Yeah, there can be some compatibility issues, particularly with key management. Key management, and what if one of your nodes fails? Like, how do you... Right, yeah, recovery can be um, challenging. It could be a nightmare, yeah. Yeah. So what do you do if you want encryption with EXT4? Well, you could let the SSD handle it if it supports hardware encryption like Opal Wall. Oh, so my drive can actually do it for me. Yeah, a lot of modern SSDs can. Or you can use LUKS, which is a software-based full-disk encryption. LUKS. And those methods, are they as good as the ZFS native encryption? They might not be snapshot aware, meaning the snapshots themselves aren't encrypted. Ah, I but see. But for most use cases, they provide a good level of security. And you avoid some of the weird bugs and slow boot times that you can sometimes get with ZFS encryption. So again, maybe a little bit simpler. Yeah, potentially less headache. All right, let's talk disaster recovery for a second. Okay. So... You know, the unthinkable happens, your server just dies. Uh-oh. How easy is it to get your data back? Yeah. ZFS, not so much, right? Especially if you need to recover on a Windows machine. Yeah, ZFS and Windows, they don't really play nice together. Not friends at all. Yeah, there are some experimental tools, but it's not something I would rely on. It's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Yeah, pretty much. But EXT4, you've got more options. Yeah, there are a lot more tools available that can read EXT4 on Windows. So in a panic situation. EXT4 is probably going to give you fewer headaches. EXT4 is looking really good. So to be clear, we're not saying ZFS is bad. No, not at all. There are absolutely use cases mm -hmm. where ZFS is the right choice. Absolutely. Like if you have tons of data, critical data. Mission critical, can't afford any corruption whatsoever. That's where those checksums and the self-healing come in really handy. Yeah, ZFS is really good at preventing silent data corruption. And those frequent snapshots. Yeah, if you need to roll back quickly and reliably, ZFS is hard to beat. And what about like replicating VMs across multiple servers or sending backups off-site? Yeah, ZFS has built-in tools for that. It's very efficient. But here's the key thing, right? You're going to use ZFS in those mission-critical environments. Mm -hmm. ECC RAM is essential. Yeah, it's highly recommended. It helps prevent data corruption at the memory level. And you're going to have to be prepared to do some serious tuning. Yeah, to get the best performance and reliability out of ZFS, you need to spend some time configuring it properly. It's not just set it and forget it. No, definitely not. But, you know, some people might actually want to learn all that stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. ZFS is a fascinating technology. It's a deep rabbit hole you can go down. Yeah, you can really geek out on it. And that's a valid reason to use it. Absolutely. If you want to learn about advanced file systems, ZFS is a great way to do it. So what we're saying is it depends. It depends on what you're doing, what your needs are, what hardware you have. Yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. If you've got a beefy server, mission-critical workloads, ECC RAM, you're comfortable with the complexity, ZFS is a great option. But if you're setting up a home server, you want something simpler, EXT4 is still a fantastic choice. It's reliable, it's stable, it's well understood. And sometimes, choosing to skip ZFS, it's not a compromise, it's the smarter move. Exactly. It's about finding the right tool for the job. So as you're planning your Proxmox build, think about what's important to you. Think about your needs, your hardware, your comfort level. Don't just assume that ZFS is the only way to go. EXT4 is still a very capable and often a much simpler option. It's a solid choice. So our final thought for you is this. What are your real priorities for your data storage? 
Is it having all the bells and whistles? Or is it ease of use and peace of mind? Maybe it's a balance of both. It's really up to you to decide. And if you want to learn more about some of the specific technologies we mentioned, like LVM Thin, QCW2, Opal, or LUKS, we encourage you to do some research. There's a ton of information out there. And who knows? Maybe you'll even decide to give ZFS a try after all. It's always good to keep learning and exploring new technologies. Absolutely. All right, that's it for this deep dive. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. And until next time, happy proxmoxing.